week on CrossFeed. What do graduation and abortion have in common? Obama. How to become a homosexual? Dipping in the offering plate. Blue collar Jesus. And church offers icy reception. Hello, everyone, and welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, Pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Delaware, Iowa. Hey, I'm Pastor Jim Butler out here in beautiful Boston, Massachusetts. Hey, everybody, welcome to another good episode of CrossFeed News. It's good to be with you this week. Yep. You know what, Jim? I had a revelation this week. I don't know we if did. I even mentioned this to you. Yep. Um, this something that it just kind of occurred to me. Um, and, and that it's a, it's a whole concept. I'm working on a blog post about it, but it's called, I call it life integration. Uh, a lot of Lutherans would recognize it as, uh, basically, uh, um, repackaged, uh, doctrine of vocation. Um, mm-hmm. but you know, I, I've been thinking about how, uh, how, you know, churches do all these programs and, and, and stuff like that. And I think that that stuff has value to some degree. But at the same time, I think what we need to focus on as Christians, as churches, as, 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 um, you know, as, as people of Christ is focusing, uh, not so much on sort of the church as a building, as a place where ministry is done, but as the people's lives, as this is where, you know, where, where does evangelism need to happen? You know, wh- whatever resources the church has, great, you know, can do some evangelism kind of work, all right? But at the same time, the main place needs to be in people's lives, you know, uh, discipleship, stewardship, kind of all these concepts that we talk about and we kind of break it down and we itemize it and, and we see that, you know, people sort of define their, their faith by where they find themselves on Sunday morning or, or, you know, or whatever time that they worship. And I think we really, as a church, are missing the boat on that. We really need to get people to move away from that idea and recognize that, no, the church is not the building. And, you know, and like I said, none of these are new concepts, all right? But it's something that I don't think has been emphasized enough. And, and I think that it's, there's just so much sort of um, misunderstanding. And that's the kind of thing that leads to uh, people who, um, who make uh, filling the pews you know, uh, numbers, their big emphasis and the, the big priority of the church and, um, just, you know, all kinds of things that, that become the emphasis because we see church as a building instead of as people. And, and we see Christianity as something you do on one day a week instead of this is something you do every moment of your life. I, I've talked in terms of holistic stewardship that the whole life is one of Christ. Yeah. Yeah. That same kind of thing. So I guess it's really, it's just kind of another term for it, but it's really got me thinking. And I found that, you know, different people have approached me with questions about all kinds of different stuff. And I have found that this concept answers 90% of those questions about what should we be doing and how should we be doing it and, and stuff like that. It's really been kind of amazing because I've been asked some very difficult questions just in the past couple of weeks. And and, and, and at first I wasn't, I, I'm sitting there reading this question and, and, or, or listening to this question and, you know, I was going, yeah, I, I'm going to need some time to think about that one. And then I, I, you know, I really, I thought of this and, and, and I started to really see the implications. I mean, I came home from lunch one day and my head was just spinning and, and, um, and, uh, you know, I, I couldn't concentrate and, and uh, because there's all these ideas were, were running around in my head and, and I had to start jotting things down. But I found that as I was kind of going through this and kind of processing all this, that, oh, wow, this like answered so many questions. <laughs> So it was just really amazing. So I just, yeah, I want to kind of throw it out there. Um, and in fact, one of the things that I've done, you know, as people know, a lot of people know I'm on Twitter and I know some of our, um, our, uh, viewers are on Twitter. Um, so hi to everybody that's following me. Um, and, uh, and if you're not uh, following me and you're on Twitter, my Twitter uh, name is CrossFeed news. And, um, but I have, uh, the, the Twitter app that I use allows, um, me to do, uh, to watch for certain words to come up. And, um, I use Nambu if anyone's interested. 
and um, and there's a, a hashtag. It's a like a keyword um, called it's pray for P R A Y and the number four. And I've added that to my um, my sort of watch list. And there's probably oh I don't know um, a couple dozen maybe a little more um, posts that come through with that hashtag um, on any given day. And, and so what I do is I just sort of watch, and, and when one of those comes up, I just take a moment and pray for that person uh, or whatever their, their need is. And, and I found it's something that's really helped me with my prayer life because otherwise I get so busy that a lot of times I'm so busy doing ministry, you know, that, that I don't stop to pray. And this is something where it's like it pops up at you. And, and it's like, hey, stop and pray. There's somebody in need, you know? And so I do. And I, and I found for me, that's really helpful. And so I'll, I'll recommend that to, you know, if anybody, that if you think that it might help you, um, I'll, it's just, it's been really kind of a cool thing for me. So that's my amazing couple of weeks that we've been gone for a couple of weeks. So, um, it's been, uh, it's, it's been an amazing couple of weeks for me. Cool. Sounds like it has been an amazing couple of weeks. My life hasn't been so amazing. I just <laughs> keep things going. But just plugging away. Huh? We haven't gotten sued. <laughs> haven't gotten sued. Oh, haven't well, that's gotten... good. Well, you guys probably don't have a lot of frozen water by you anymore this time of year. Well, no, not this time of year, but during the the, the winter, we certainly do. Sure. And um, where is this taking place? Uh, I think it's in Missouri. Uh, because St. It, Clair County, I'm not sure where that is. Although it says the lawyers from St. Louis, yeah. But Madison Record and St. Clair Record, and I, I was I having know. a hard time figuring out where exactly this is. But it must Stop be somewhere maybe. close to St. Louis. Yeah, since the person. But anyway, so there's this woman, uh, um, Vernetta Clayton is her name, and she is a member of New Life Ch- in Christ Church. Apparently not a, a a Lutheran church or any kind of church. That's no, uh, right. not a denomination. I love the name New Life in Christ. That's a great name. Mm-hmm. Um, Good baptismal name, but that's probably not how they see no, it. No, probably not. But I, if I was going to, you know, start a church brand new and plant a church, that would probably be the name I would pick. Something like New Life or New Beginnings or something like that. Mm-hmm. But anyway, so um, so they had uh, some shrubs apparently and. Uh, it, water ran off the shrubbery into the sidewalk. They didn't salt it or anything. And apparently, on her way to church, she uh, slipped, she fell, suffered bruises, contusions, abrasions to her body, suffered from hyperextended fingers to her right hand, and wrench strained and sprained her right knee, uh, and suffered a tear of the meniscus of the right knee. Uh, is going to have some surgery. Uh, have to um, and going to endure pain on work, labor, hurt her ability to enjoy life, and so she's doing the church for fifty thousand dollars and anything else the court thinks is fair. Okay, now this is why God created insurance companies. Yeah, at the same time, I. I don't know. I mean, like, I, okay, I understand the whole concept of, of negligence and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and on the one hand, you know, they're just going to see it as, well, this is just an insurance thing. You know, a lot of people in America have this idea that I'm not suing you. I'm suing your insurance company, you know, and, but that's why insurance rates are so high, <laughs> you know? Uh, of course, I don't know. I mean, maybe she can't afford the surgery. Maybe this is, you know, I, I don't know. There, there's so many things, again, that you don't know. Right. Um, and this is from a legal website. It's just, it's basically just a report on the legal proceedings. There's no interview or anything like that to kind of get more information on it. And um, my first church, we had a situation. A uh, young girl fell from a, a geodesic dome. And just landed wrong and, and broke her leg. I mean, it was just such kids fell from a thing. You know, kids climbed on it. Kids fell from it. My son climbed it and jumped off, and he was fine. But, you know, she just landed, on, landed wrong. And this poor family had gone through two or three other things. So, we, you know, we, we said, we'll tell you what. Well, we won't charge you tuition for the rest of the year because, you know, we know 
her father had been in a car accident and, you know, it's a lot of different things were going on and bills were mounting. And so we decided to do him a favor. And uh, I got a letter from this lawyer. We got a letter from this lawyer saying that they were going to sue, sue our school because, um, you know, and uh, I wrote her, I remember writing her back a letter saying, you know, I really wish you wouldn't do this. The, the family back saying, you know, I, we, we really tried to help you out here. We, we went out of our way. Uh, you know, arranging rides for your kid and doing all kinds of other stuff. You know, don't really appreciate being sued. And um, then we got a letter back from them saying they dropped it. But what it was was, you know, some of their friends going, uh, you know, looking not at really at, at that real – actually that situation, but all the other medical bills they had mostly from her husband and his car accident and everything, the loss of income, and saying it was that attitude of, well, you know, sue the church. Their insurance company will settle with you, and you'll get X number of dollars out of this. Mm-hmm. Of course, one third of it would go to the lawyer too, right? I, you know, here this. You know what this reminds me of? Um, I once heard that the um, the number one most commonly stolen book uh, from libraries is the Bible. Hmm. You know, and I thought, how stupid is that? I mean, they're giving them away everywhere. You want a Bible, contact the Gideons. They'll give you one. Go to your local church. You know, you come to our church. We don't have a budget for that. But if you come to our church and say, I don't have a Bible, I need one, I'll give you one of the church's Bibles, and nobody's going to complain about having to buy an extra Bible. All right? You know, I mean, we you know, we want people to have them. All right? Well, the same thing here that what this is, this is trying to take something that people are willing to give you. Now, I don't know the specific, uh, you know, situation with the church. I don't know whether she went and approached the church first. Um, you know, if I had to guess based on statistics, I'm guessing she didn't. But at the same time, I should give the benefit of the doubt. But then it comes down to who do you give the benefit of the doubt to, her or the church? Because I'm thinking that, you know, if she fell in that, I'm thinking that, pastor needs to stand up and say, look, you know, she's incurred these, um, these, she's going to need surgery and stuff like that. Um, it's, you know, I mean, cause when it says, uh, uh, talking about enjoying life, you know, that, that makes me think that this isn't just, uh, I'm trying to cover my bills. Um, but you know, if you said, look, this person needs this money, you know, they're, um, we, we feel bad about this happening. Let's uh, everybody pitch in and uh, see if we can cover costs. And while we're at it, let's uh, set up a schedule to uh, everybody take her, um, take dinner to the family um, uh, each night, you know, so that um, because she can't, if, if she's laid up, if she's the primary cook in the family, which, you know, maybe, maybe not, but, um, you know, certainly the husband's going to be uh, busy, uh, assuming she's married. Um, but you know, obviously she's going to, they're going to need a little extra help, right? If she's laid up. So let's everybody in the congregation pitch in and help out, you know, life integration. <laughs> but, but, you know, but it goes back, but on the other hand, um, yeah, I, I, if, if it's medical bills and stuff that she needs to take care of, there's a good chance that the, the church's liability insurance would do that anyway. Because something sorry. like this, I think, yeah, I, don't, I don't think there's too much question of liability. You you had an icy patch. You didn't salt it. You didn't sand it. You're liable. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that they would probably accept liability. But um, the, the, what really gets me, though, of course, is that she's a member of the church. Yeah, and that's what really gets me. And she's a member of the congregation, and she's suing the church where she's a member. Uh, that's what I just I just like. What kind of member? I'm glad I don't have members like that in my church. Yeah, yeah. This isn't just like their kid goes to the school or something like that. She's a member of the congregation. She's going to, you know, the cost of the um of the lawsuit is going to come out of her offering dollars. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 and the other thing that scares me about this is that a lot of churches are almost paralyzed by the thought of liability and and, and stuff like that. I, and I, there's a church uh, up here, and they had kids. Um, they, they had this big. Uh, parking lot and kids would skateboard there and they would keep trying to chase the kids off because we're afraid of liability and i'm like you've come on, you've got kids coming close to your bill why don't you go out and engage them yeah talk to them yeah not sit there and say you come on our property we're going to get sued i mean 
you know, uh, uh, but I know churches that, that, you know, and they don't want, and I know churches don't want any outside groups to come in because they're afraid somebody getting hurt and they're going to be liable for it. Uh, Did and, I tell you the uh, story about the, um, the, the winter storm that we had right before Christmas? I'm trying to remember if I told that story on here. Um, I can't, I don't remember. We got, we got hammered with snow. I mean, it was just horrible. The, all the roads were closed everywhere. It was like, I mean, it was, it was like the 22nd or 23rd of December. It was three o'clock in the morning. I was up. I mean, I was still awake. I hadn't gotten to bed yet because it was just such a busy time. You know, I was up late working on stuff and, um, and the phone rings and it's somebody from the community who says, Hey, there's a family in a car, um, down at the, there's a truck stop, not a um, couple blocks away from here. And they said, um, is there, you know, they're, they're, they're stranded there. And, um, you know, they really, they need a place to stay. Do you think that you could open up the church to them or something like that? Now, okay. On the one hand, it was three o'clock in the morning. I wasn't thinking real clearly. And, and so at the same time, my first thought was, if I let them stay there, what's going to happen? You know, are, are they, is, is something going to happen? We're going to be liable. Is something going to get stolen? You know, it's like, because I know who these people are. And like, and I thought about it, you know, just, and, and this person that called me, who's not a member of the congregation noticed the pause, you know? And, and she goes, you are a church, you know? <laughs> and it was sort of like, yeah, yeah. I'll see what I could do. Yeah. Definitely, you know, but I was, I, you know, to this day, I'm embarrassed that I even paused to think about it, you know, and you I mean, didn't think about it. It was 3 a.m. You weren't thinking <laughs> clearly. You're just trying to think, period. Okay. I'll make the excuse. <laughs> but I mean, no, seriously, the first thing I thought of was insurance and, and I'm, I'm, it's embarrassing and it's ridiculous. All right. Because I shouldn't have thought that way. I should have thought there's people in need and you know what, if something gets stolen, if something gets broken, whatever, you know what, we were helping people out. And as long as the church doesn't get burned down, you know, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. these people are stranded. Well, as it, so I called the sheriff and they went down, um, they got to the family and said, Hey, you know, there's church a couple blocks away. If you want to spend the night there, you can. And, um, and they declined the offer and, and okay, you want to spend the night in your car, you know, go for it. But, um, you know, I, we did offer and, and when they, the sheriff called me back and said, no, they're not interested. Um, you know, I said, well, you know, let them know if, if they need some breakfast in the morning or something, you know, just let us know and, and we'll, we'll do whatever we can to help them out. And, um, so, you know, they didn't take us up on our offer, but, you know, but it was just, it was that whole thing that like, oh, insurance, you know what? Churches cannot be run by insurance. You know, we were, I was told at seminary, I might've mentioned this on the show. Um, yeah, I might've told that story when Joe was here. Cause I seem like I told it. Well, okay, anyway, don't, right, go ahead. Um, Joe, also known as fake Jim. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I forgot where I was going. Um, I don't know. Just, Oh, I know. I was told at the seminary that, um, that don't let, don't let little kids hug you, you know, because then, you know, they could, it could be misconstrued or something like that. You know, if a little kid runs up to me and wants to give me a hug, I'm going to hug him back. All right. I'm, you know, just because they see you as God's representative, they love God. And so they want to give you a hug, you know, it's like, pass it on. And then, well, the key there, though, no, okay, that that's the, just do it always in public and never be alone any place with somebody else's kid or, or you know, some sure. other, right, or yeah, or or, or 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 any female or something like that. You know, you there are just, just, just there, there's common sense stuff just because of of other things. And uh, believe me, I live in Massachusetts. I know. Um, on the other hand, you know what they really should have done for this woman. They should have just let her make take money right out of the offering plate. There you go. Ooh, that was a good one. 
I am such I I I I am the king of the segways. <laughs> Let us just be honest, man. It, I am the master segway master over here. Jim Jim is thinking tonight. You can tell it's not three a.m. Of course, you can tell uh, <laughs> you can tell it's not three a.m. by looking behind me, and you can see that the the sun's not down yet. But um, pro- actually, he's on vacation in Alaska. It really is <laughs> you know, like eleven o'clock out there right now. <laughs> so, you know, Dale moved. He he's really not in Iowa anymore. That's why that's why we talked about this terrible snowstorm. You know, they don't get those in Iowa. <laughs> Iowa, Florida. See, they both end with ah. You know, they're kind of really the same thing. Alabama, Georgia. Yeah. So, the same. By the end anyway. of the show, it'll be dark, though. Watch that. Oh. That's cool. So, anyhow, this um, it, this is in Texas. And um, what is it's this? It's Argyle, the Cross Timbers Community Church. Yep. And... Um, the, the pastor there, Toby Sloff, I guess how you'd say his last name, S-L-O-U-G-H, you know. So I don't know if that's like through, so it would be slew, or if it would be... Slough, like, like slough off. <laughs> like it, like enough, so it would be slough, I don't know. But anyway. You, you, ever see, you ever see that poem that all the words end with O-U-G-H and you pronounce it differently in every single line? <laughs> so it doesn't actually rhyme. Right. It looks like it should. They all end the same way, but they pronounce every word differently. That's awesome. No, I haven't seen that. It's, it's a great uh, poem. But anyway, I'll have to find it someday. But anyway, uh, it's a non-denominational church in Argyle, Texas, the home of Sox. And um, so one time he, he, he said um, the people in the church were struggling. And he said, when you when the offering plate comes by, if you need money, just take it out. And that day, he said, they've, they've took in the largest offering they've ever had. Um, and so since then, they've given a half million dollars in the past two months. Uh, single moms, widows in trouble, local mission, people behind on the utility bills and all kinds of things. Yeah. This, is, this has got to be a big church. I mean, because be yeah, I mean, there's no way that our congregation of 200 – could give away half a million dollars even if everybody liquidated all their assets. <laughs> that's what, that's just what they pay Dale every every you know yeah. every year. Something like that. <laughs> so um so I you know I think this is brilliant though. Now you've got to be a you know a, a decent sized church um to be able to pull this off. I'm not sure how they know how much they give away if people put money in and other people take money out i i don't know either i that that's that's an interesting part the other part of it that, that i'm not sure you know I, I um if you go to the web the website it says they, they have a full report of the church project and i probably should have looked up more in depth on this and how they did it um because it, what would concern me um would be um some accountability for the money um yeah. i i i I had a guy come up to me one time um, and wanted to get to uh, take a bus to go see his father and uh, in New York. And I was really stressed on the time. And I um, <clears throat> took him to the bus station and I foolishly, I bought him so- something to eat and then foolishly I gave him money. Mm. And then I was at another church two or three nights later and he shows up. <laughs> um and um, went and talked to the pastor there, and he just looks at me like, I know you somewhere before. I've, I've seen you somewhere. And then I said, yeah, I'll, I'll go see about getting the pastor here. And uh, and, and he, he recognized me and ran off. Uh, so, you know, uh, even if I bought him the, the bus ticket, that was in Springfield, and people went to New York all the time. So he could have, you know, stood outside and sold it, and, you know, for half its value. And, mm-hmm. and use the money for what you're using it for. So that would be what would concern me. It would especially concern me once this went out on the news, because I said it was a local TV station, and how yeah. many people – I wonder what his attendance was the next Sunday. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, we have – I think I've mentioned this on the show before, but I highly recommend this system. Um, we have all the churches in the in the county – um, that are interested in participating in this um, are all uh, connected. We've got one central contact person. He's actually one of the local undertakers. And um, and anytime somebody comes looking for a handout, 
the um you get their ID and you call this person. And so if they you, cuz you get people to go from church to church um like Jim's talking about. And um so you know if if this person's gone to one church and then and they got a handout and then they go to the next church looking for a handout you say um yeah you know you're trying to work the system here um you're not really being honest about who you are or what you need and um you know so we've got you can either get uh you can get a, a your gas tank filled up um you can get your uh, a meal for you and if your family that will feed the whole family a meal at one of the local restaurants and um and you can stay a night at uh one of the local hotels and we've got arrangements made with all of them um so that it's all set to go and it, it prevents people from abusing the system um if anybody's local um you know this is for people that are passing through if anybody's local um we have uh charity organizations uh, in place that work with Department of Human Services and stuff like that uh, that are able to provide. We've got, um, in fact, I'm on the board of directors for our local food bank, um, and we give out a lot of, lot of food. Um, but we also have a tremendous community. I mean, our food bank is so full right now that you can barely get into it. Um, and, and we've been giving out a record amount of food with the economic uh, downturn in the country. Um, and uh, also having, we've got a uh, organization that takes care of things like uh, toiletries and, you know, uh, paper products and the kind of things that you need on a daily basis, but, um, you know, you don't normally get at a food bank. And mm -hmm. so, and they have, they also have like clothes and, and things like that too. So, um, you know, even in our small community, we've got stuff like that in place. And so I recommend, you know, getting stuff like that in place. Um and so, so that way when people do have needs, yeah, you can have some kind of accountability. Cause I mean, I had a guy come through one time, he wanted a ride to Dubuque cause he had a hospital appointment and, um, it was Sunday afternoon. I went, you've got a doctor appointment on a Sunday afternoon. I said, which hospital? He says the Catholic one. All right. There is a Catholic hospital in Dubuque, but nobody calls it that. <laughs> and, uh, and so I was like, it was something was kind of fishy. So I, I took his ID and, and normally I call the, you know, this undertaker guy, I called the police <laughs> and said, um, do you, you know, what can you tell me about this guy? Anything? And they said, oh yeah, he was just at the hospital in Manchester, uh, which is the closest uh, city. And, um, and he was, uh, faking some kind of ailments. So the, to trying to get the doctor to prescribe some drugs. And uh, so like, oh, that's why he's trying to get to the next hospital. And so they said, I was like, well, I, I really am not uh, comfortable getting into the car with this guy and driving him anywhere. And, and my wife's going, you're not going anywhere with this guy. You know? <laughs> and, uh, so, um, they said, they said, tell you what, um, tell him if he wants a ride, uh, the sheriff will give him a ride in the squad to the County line and drop him off there. And, uh, so I, I, I came back to him. I said, here's what I can offer you. I can offer you a ride, um, to the County line. It'll get you about halfway there at least. And, um, and you can probably hitch a ride with somebody else or, or something like that at that point. And, uh, <laughs> and like in a squad, I said, yeah, but you know, they'll get you there. Goes, I think I'll try my luck down at the truck stop. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, when I was, you know, I used to really, I don't know about you. I used to really struggle with that. I was, I was just, you know, I was a soft touch. I, I, you know, I would fall for any sob story that was out there. And, uh, but, you know, I, but at least, you know, a lot of times it gets out. And, um, we, you know, we, we had that problem because I was my first church because I was a soft touch. And so the senior pastor just said, from now on, anybody calling, let me talk to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, once the man said, okay, you know, because he, he knew I really struggled with saying no, and he had no experience, he had no problem with it. You know, and say, this is what we can do. Here, here it is. Here's, here's your whole thing, you know. Uh, and it was amazing how quickly it dropped off. But the word had gotten out that, you know, you could get whatever you needed and or wanted. Let me say that. Rather than not know what you needed, what you wanted. And... um and but once it, it got out, then all of a sudden the phone calls just dried up because word was out now that you know they're not going to do anything for you. Mm -hmm. 
So, so yeah, no, we found out that there was actually um, in one of the nearby cities, in one of the truck stop bathrooms, um, was written down um, the one of the local churches around here. And and I really feel bad for the um, the churches. You know, we're St. Paul's, so we're like down at the end of the alphabet. People will go through um, alphabetically, and around here, if I remember right, community congregational is uh, at the top of the alphabet <laughs> as far as churches in the area. So he gets nailed most of all. <laughs> And in fact, a lot of times he'll send out a note to all the other pastors around uh, just to let people know, you know, even if, if he can't get a hold of, of our contact or sometimes he'll just do it anyway just to let people know. So, yep. But, well, I, you know, common people have common problems and they probably need a common Jesus. There you go. Which brings us to Jesus in blue jeans. This is Blue Collar Jesus, not to be confused with uh, Jesus the Cable Guy. <laughs> That's right. Well, okay, so this is in uh, um, in London, um, and uh, Our Lady uh, Immaculate and St. Philip Neri Catholic Church in Uckfield. 35,000 pounds. It's a bronze statue of Jesus. And his best baggy jeans. <laughs> yeah, he's wearing a kind of a, a, a shirt, a button shirt that's kind of slightly buttoned and billowing in the wind. His hair is kind of blowing, but it's it's not long. It's it's kind of cut short, fashionably and, trimmed. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I saw the paper article. that's fashionably trimmed. But you know, he looks like he needs to be on a surfboard. <laughs> yeah, he does. Even the way he's standing. Yeah, <laughs> it's like they need the surfboard under there. Um, yeah, that reminds me of that awful movie, Batman and Robin, where they're jumping out of the 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 the, the ship, Mister Freeze's ship, on those you know on the doors and flying them down. You know, it looks like you know. It reminds me of that picture. Um, okay. First off, I think. The idea of Jesus in shirt and blue jeans is cool. Me too. Okay, I like that. What I and and, and uh, he says it's oh you're always looking for a new way to enrich people and experience of Christianity. It's good people could be open minded to appreciate it. Okay, I, I agree with that. I have no problems. Uh, I I just think because I you know if you think of Jesus today, you would think Jesus I would be in blue jeans uh, and a you know button-down shirt or a polo shirt or something. I mean, he would be... He, he was a common person. He was just like everyone else. Yep. What I don't like um, is we wanted a figure of Jesus not in suffering, but dynamic mm -hmm. and welcoming. And I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't want to overstate the case, but it, it almost sounds like we we don't we don't want this idea of a dying Jesus. Yeah. It's almost like that that the scandal of the cross. I got a bad feeling about this. You know, you, you've heard of those. You know, and I don't know how many they actually exist. I've never seen one, but you know, so you hear about some of the mega churches. There's no cross in there at all. Right. You know, because you know that that might be offensive. It almost sounds like that. I'm not. I don't know. If that's what he means. But that that's that's the one thing that kind of worries me. Is we don't want a suffering Jesus. Yeah, you know what? If your Jesus didn't come to suffer for you, you've completely missed the point. And in fact, it's so ironic because you know when I look at the, this picture. And by the way, I'll, uh, for those watching the video, I'll I'll snag the picture and throw it at the end of the um, episode. But um, as you know. The, the passage that came to mind was, uh, even though, uh, no, I had this in my head before. Um, even though he was, it, um, had the nature of God, he did not, he did not consider it, uh, something to be grasped, but he did not consider equality. God was something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking on the form of a servant and being found in fashion as a man. 
He humbled self, became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore hath God highly exalted him, and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Oh, whoops. I forgot I had something on the back of that. Oh. <laughs> The psalm writer says, Thy word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So if you want your kids in confirmation, remember that. You should memorize it yourself. I had it memorized. <laughs> had. I mean, I, had. Well, no, had I, mean, I mean, like a half hour ago. I mean, I was, or, or you know, as I was going through Just this like story. confirmation. He memorized it long enough to get through the, the podcast. Then he was going to forget all about it. No, I didn't even open a Bible or anything. I just went, oh, this reminds me of that passage. And I ran through the passage in my head and it was all set. But, you know, it's three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> it's 3 a.m. You know your yeah. past podcast past <laughs> Sorry about this. I know oh, it's a bit man. silly. But anyway, <laughs> that's the passage you know, that sprang to mind because he's – you know, as he's dressed like this, he's in the form of a servant, right? Mm -hmm. But what is the ultimate servanthood? Is giving up your life for someone, and that's what he did. That's how he lived out his servanthood, you know. Um, and I've I've seen churches that that sort of de-emphasize the cross, but they emphasize the washing feet, right? Yeah, the washing feet was sort of uh, the hors d'oeuvre of the servanthood, you know. Um, that wasn't the main course. And if you if you stop with the foot washing and you never get to the cross, you just leave people hungry. Of course, this being a Catholic church, they probably do have crucifixes all over the place. I would imagine. This is outside. This isn't, you know, over the altar or anything. I imagine you got inside the church and saw the cry and, and, and over the altar there would be a crucifix. So I don't think it's, you know, totally the idea of we're rejecting a suffering Savior. I think maybe the idea is this, we want to, you know, it could be, um, you know, uh, uh, um, this depiction of Jesus. As he, especially as the people come into the church, we want to be welcoming and dynamic, which, okay, I can understand that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, it's a pretty short article, and, you know, we don't have the... It's it's the problem with any time you are the sort of um, blogging kind of thing. I mean, you're, you you look at an article and you all you have is the information that's in front of you, and um, so it, you always have to kind of look at both sides of it and give them the benefit yeah. of the doubt. I like his um, I like the uh, the uh, the artist. I like his thing. It says uh, um, the sculpture is simple, direct. I hope it sums up the feeling that Christ is always with us and we are not to be afraid. His clothing is being blown vigorously to add a sense of him being alive and his strength in defying earthly cares. Uh, the, the clothing is loosely contemporary in order to connect Christ to his people now as much to the past. Um, I hope this sculpture will inspire and communicate in very human terms, reaching out and being relevant to both congregation and local community. So I think that's you know kind of neat though that how he's looking at this, and um, and this picture by the way it's going to go on top of their bell tower, the, the statue. So I think up there it might look really it'd probably look better if he had a surfboard, but you know hey, <laughs> you know, but I think I, I you know I think, think I'd like to almost go there someday and see it what it looks like because it really does sound pretty cool. Yep. Uh, so you know this is like. Um, We've talked about how, uh, in if you go over to China, the um, the nativity scenes there show Jesus as Chinese, um, and the artwork and stuff like that. Um, if you go to Africa, he's black, and you know, and, and stuff like that. And the idea is that he came for all people, no matter who you are. And so they display him as you know, he came to be one of us. And so I think that's cool. It's just like you know, Western. He's always. He always, um, in Western artwork, looks like he's from Western Europe, you know? <laughs> yep. I mean, how often have you seen a picture of Jesus that he actually looked Jewish? <laughs> you know, they need to have Neil Diamond at their dedication to sing Forever in Blue Jeans. <laughs> <laughs> you know, 
That's, that would be ecumenical. Good Jewish guy dedicating that you know, forever in blue. And afterwards, yeah, he can, you know, sing Sweet Caroline for all the Red Sox fans that are out there. <laughs> okay. Uh, moving on from that, uh, the next two both deal with schools. Uh, well, okay. Um, I don't know. Since we're dealing with, we talked about a Catholic church, should we talk about the Catholic university? Sure. So, yeah, let's, let's move over to the – yeah, that'd be good. Move over to the Catholic University. Now, I have a two-year-old nephew uh, uh, named Jaden, and uh, to his credit, we were watching television um, uh, down at my dad's when before my dad's death, and the president comes on, and he sees the president, and he goes, oh, baba. <laughs> so <laughs> – he knows the president. <laughs> oh, Bubba. <laughs> so, I don't know if he saw his buddy Oh, Bubba at the uh, um, at Notre Dame or not. Uh, of course, this this was very very controversial uh, among among many Catholics that uh, President Obama had been uh, invited to give the graduation address at, at Notre Dame um, because he's got a real basic difference with them in in the area of abortion. Mm-hmm. Now. I don't know. Okay, I, I does an invitation to the president um, and giving an honorary doctorate, which is generally pretty standard that you do that. Does that mean then that you necessarily agree with everything the speaker is going to say? Probably not. Although you know, I do have to say with this honorary doctorate thing. Um, I know that it's 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 sort of standard, but not always. And in fact, what was it? The week before, he was at Arizona, and uh, and they didn't give him an honorary doctor because they said, "Ah, oh, it's a little early for that." You know, you haven't. Let's see what you actually accomplish first. You know. Yeah, which I just thought was being okay. I he's the president of the United States. Just you, you just always you know that's just standard. I mean, the the, the flip side of that, by the way, is then. But going there and accepting the degree from that institution, does that say I necessarily agree with everything this institution says and stands for? Uh, I mean, yeah, the man who received the most, I think he's in Guinness for the most honorary degrees, it used to be the president of Notre Dame, Theodore Hesburgh. And I remember seeing a picture of him one time with all these, uh, you know, doctor's hoods from all these universities where he'd given the commencement address. I mean, does, again, does that say that he agreed with every with all the positions taken by all the universities and colleges where he spoke. Um, but anyway, so President Obama, to his credit again, I, I think really, you know, uh, um, I disagree with him in a lot of areas. To his credit, he he, he dealt with the abor- abortion issue. And I, I thought he tried he, – and I thought he tried to finesse it a little bit. Yeah, but okay, before we even get into how he addressed sure. the issue, here's my sure. question. This was a commencement speech, all right? Is a commencement speech the place for addressing a political issue? Because I thought, you know, generally you go and you, you talk about, um, you know, Sort of giving advice for, you know, how to live your life. And I guess it's sort of like that. Um, but I just thought, you know, there are a million different things that he could have talked about. And it just seemed kind of odd that he was going to bring up this, you know, this really heated um, topic in and in a place that is specifically dedicated to one side of that. Right. Well, I think though that again, because there, if if I think a lot of the questions hadn't come up, I don't know the debate. A lot of people saying you should, you know, uh, uh, they should withdraw the invitation, or you know, or they, uh, or or the students, the students who said I, I, I'm not going to attend commencement. You know, they allowed students, you know, not to attend commencement. There's like what I think 25 of them or something. You know, some some of them said, you know, we're, we're, I'm not going to attend the commencement uh, because of this. Um, you know, I, because of that, I think him bringing it up was proper. As you wish. You know, I if suppose. it had been, In that um, sense, since there are people that interrupted his speech um, a few times 
uh, with uh, shouts, uh, abortion is murder, stop killing our children. Um, so yeah. I, I think so. I think had some of the topic had the discussion that come up because I remember, uh, but he, I mean the week before the week before when he did speak at Arizona State, and they talked about you know, that idea that you hadn't really accomplished anything. Let's find out first. You know, like, he mentioned that. You know, um, mm-hmm. I can't remember. You know, but he 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 referred to that to the fact that they had said that. So I I think you know to to, to talk deal with some of the, the the discussion that had brought up. I personally I thought it looked a little weird the other way to have all this discussion, to, you know, the controversy surrounding him showing up and then not say anything about it. Yeah, fair enough. I guess I think some people you know look at it kind of like is this guy sitting there with his head in the sand. Uh, but I know uh, President Bush. I know when he, you know, spoke at some colleges and stuff, and people, uh, uh, you know, protested that because of what was going on in the Iraq War. He he wasn't afraid to talk about what was happening in the, the Iraq War and what he supported and stuff. So, but anyway, so, uh, go ahead. Okay, so the the way what he said is, um, uh, he he emphasized the importance of common ground. Um, as opponents of abortion rights protest his appearance and honorary degree, um, he said he called for a greater understanding on all sides, open hearts, open minds, fair-minded words. Um, and uh, he said, I do not suggest the debate surrounding abortion can or should go away. At some level, the views of the two camps are irreconcilable. Each side will continue to make its case to the public with passion and conviction, but surely we can do so without reducing those with uh, differing views on uh, uh, with reducing those with differing views to caricature. All right, I agree with that because you're not going to, you know, you just resort to name calling and stuff like that. You sort of take the Rush Limbaugh approach, all right? You're not going to accomplish anything. All right, you're just you're just going to create problems. You're you're going to create a greater division and and it becomes impossible to discuss this stuff. Okay? Um at this, you know, but then he goes on and says uh uh, borrowing from uh, President Clinton, um, spoke on the need to reduce unwanted pregnancies and encourage adoptions, um, which both sides can agree, can agree on. But, you know, at the same time, it's sort of like, um, and he talked about reducing unwanted pregnancies. He didn't talk about reducing abortions um, because something that, that really bothers me is that something that Democrats have stopped saying, um, but safe, legal, and rare, all right? Um, I'm sorry, but you don't really want it rare unless you're doing something to reduce it. And, um, you know, putting condoms in schools is not the answer. Uh, you know, sex ed is not the answer. Um, it's actually changing our society's attitude toward casual sex. All right. That is the only thing that is going to reduce the number of pregnancies, of unwanted pregnancies and the re- and therefore reduce the number of abortions. And until people realize that, then you're not going to see a reduction. And as long as you keep emphasizing a woman's right to choose, all right, she is always going to consider that option. All right. It's just like making divorce easy. All right. Guess what? You make divorce easy. The number of divorces go up. You make divorce difficult, people go, well, gee, maybe I should try and work it out. It'd be easier than going through all the hassle. You know? I mean, is it, is it still going to happen? Sure. Absolutely. You know, there were divorces back when it was difficult, but they weren't nearly as common because people realized that, you know, that's a lot of work. Maybe it'd be easier to just work it out. And the same thing with abortion, you know, is 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 carrying a pregnancy through to term difficult when... um when it's when you don't really want to be pregnant and you don't really want to have a baby. Yeah, it is. All right. At the same time, is it worth it to save the life of the child? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and how often are the, uh, those in the abortion camp talking about, um, adoption? All right. You just, I'm sorry, but you don't hear it. And so, I mean, that's my indictment of the abortion camp. Like, let me hear, let me hear you say, um, you know, I, and, and frankly, I wouldn't be as upset about the whole abortion thing. I still consider it murder. Okay. I mean, flat out I do, but at the same time, if they would say adoption first, abortion as a last resort, and that was their, their, um, their cry, I'd say, 
well, you know what? Now we can talk. But until that time, un- until, in, you know, otherwise it's, it's more, um, I want privileges without responsibility. I want to do what I want and not have any consequences. Well, I'm sorry. I can't agree with that. You know, I'm going to make somebody else die. Okay. So that I can have a nice night. We're in trouble. And so, you know, they, they talk about this, these guys screaming out abortion is murder and stop killing our children. Okay. You know what? If I'm going to sit down and actually talk with somebody about it, we'll agree on some, you know, I, I've stopped saying abortion mills. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll say, uh, abortion facilities. Okay, fine. I'm not going to call it an abortion clinic though, because a clinic is where you go for healing. All right. And when you go in for an abortion, that's not, you know, 99 times out of a hundred, you're not going there for healing. All right. You go in there and somebody's going to die. And so you have, you know, you've probably heard the, the slogan, one wounded, one dead. All right. And in, in most cases, healing, it would be better off for the woman's health to carry that pregnancy through to term. And if necessary, give up the child for adoption. So I'm sorry, ranting. <laughs> and you did such a nice job of it. I can't find the quote I was looking for, but. And anyway, I talked about, you know, not um, demonizing each other. I get this woman, you know, I'm an Obama supporter, and these Christians, you know, these pro-life people, the only time they care about it's in the womb. Once it's out of the womb, they don't care. Yeah, you yeah. Know, and, and, That's and, why and, Christians run adoption agencies. And, and have, and with the, you know, World Vision, the largest, um, Christian, the largest relief organization in the world. Yeah, yeah. It's it's so it's just one of those things. I mean, okay, you know, get now. Come on, if you're going to believe this, then you know, if you're gonna, you know, wow, why not? Why not? You know, if you if you're gonna get mad at us, mad at people for you know disagreeing with him or whatever, then don't you know, don't don't do that. You know, listen to what he's saying. Let's let's try to not demonize it. Uh, uh, it was you know, I mean, I I was probably one of the few people who really appreciated. Um, you know, President Clinton, when he talked about staying away from the um, uh, per- politics of personal destru- destruction, only, of course, to, you know, watch, you know, them completely smear people. But, uh, you know, uh, but that happens on both sides, and, it, and it's sad when that kind of stuff happens. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because oh, you're never going to get anywhere then, you know? I, it's, uh, you know, you, you can go around... Uh, you know, I, I've seen, uh, you know, bumper stickers, stuff like that. Oh, we, we talked about the, the, the bus sign thing. All right. A fool says in his heart, there is no God. You know, and I actually turned that into a newsletter article about the bus signs. Um, for at our church, I talked about, uh, what do you, what do you want on your bus? If, you know, if you had money to, to spend on a bus or, or for that matter, what message is your life sending? Okay. And what it comes down to is, while I may agree, with the statement, a fool says in his heart, there is no God. I can't really argue with it because it's the word of God that says it. At the same time, that was directed to um, to God's people. That was not a message sent to atheists, all right? Because you're just going to offend people. They're going to turn off, you know? So, I mean, I do think we need to listen to one another and treat each other respectfully. I think that's very, very important that we do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but... I think it's also important that he, I had got a laugh. Ultimately, at some level, the two sides are irreconcilable. At some level, yeah, I, yeah. It's, I would say, yeah, at some level, I, I yeah, that's a very, I thought that's a very, you know, artful way of putting it. The, the, but, the basic premise, maybe. You know, yeah, you know, yeah. I think I think it goes more than just at some level. They're, they're, but you know, yeah. But ultimately, the other fact is that they are irreconcilable. One either is going to lead to a culture of life, or the other will lead to a culture of death. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what it comes down to. You know, it's either going to be a culture of uh, uh, of really trying to respect life in all of its forms, or it's going to be a culture of utilitarianism. Um, in which case, you know, we're going to go the same way they've already gone in in, in the Netherlands of well, at old age, of saying. You no longer contribute. You no longer matter. Yeah, it's like Logan's Run. 
you know. You just watch to watch Farrah Fawcett. Okay. From there, we're going to go to a different school. And this one's a public school out in California, out around the, uh, I guess it's around the San Diego area because this is out of uh, the Mercury, San, San, Diego, San Diego Mercury. Castro Valley Schools. And I, I don't know, I, this is one I, I have a trouble even commenting on. I'd like to know more. But anyway, apparently there is a, a lesbian pastor, Pastor Arlene Naring of the Eden Church. Of Hayward. Uh, of Hayward. I don't even know what Eden Church, I don't know if it's a congregational church, I don't know if it's a, uh, a gay-friendly church, I don't know anything about it. But anyway, she spoke during the Days of Diversity program. Yep. And some parents became upset after an anonymous email was sent claiming that she gave step-by-step instructions on how to become gay and transsexual, and she denies those claims. Uh, Okay, all right. Number one, this is an anonymous email. Number two, I have never in my life met a homosexual, and I've met many of them, okay? I hung around with a lot of them in college, okay? And... I have never met one that talked about becoming one. Most of them believe that you're born that way right. or, or that you become one as a result um, of the, your sort of your upbringing possibly as a, you know, it's the whole nature versus nurture um, debate isn't closed yet, but you know, I mean, most of them think it's genetic, which it may right. or may not be, but um, it's, but you, so I, it's like, this is an anonymous email, <laughs> right? Right. I mean, yeah. Making I just I, I read that. Said, I said, I said it. You know, he gave instructions. I mean, I mean, did did she encourage um, experimentation? I don't know. Thirty-one parents have sued. Um, based on an anonymous email. Based on an anonymous email. Okay, I think the school district. I, I don't know why the school district simply can't say, here's a transcription of what she said. Well, they might not have it. I don't know if yeah. it was recorded, but. I, well, I, or, but yeah, but she's got to have some sort of notes or something that, you know, can state that, you know, there, that surely there were, you know, there was a teacher or two there who could say this is what she said. Yeah. I mean, there is something about, you know, witnesses and they, you know, they should be able to say that. Or you should be able to get, you know, ask uh, students, you know, what, you know, can, you know, best of your ability, what do you remember she said? Yeah, ask your kids. I mean, these are parents. Ask the kid, did they say this? You know? <laughs> ask your kids. <laughs> of course, so the, 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 you know, uh, I, you know, I, 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 I mean, kids you know, I struggle with the whole idea of, you know, there is the, the, a movement in the country. Um, it's gone the idea of being tolerant of homosexuality to be an acceptance of homosexuality, and and even seeing it as superior. That you know, when when somebody is um, is is gay, it's something that you know, gay pride. It's it's, it's something to be celebrated, not just um, you know. So it, it's actually it's it's almost gotten to the point of being preferable. All right, that's not what tolerance is. Okay, tolerance is. I um I disagree with you but I'm not going to um attack you for it. Right. But I respect you. Yeah, right. I disagree with you but I respect you. And it's it's it's, it's uh, you know uh, uh but that's you know um a whole other you know but but yeah I I just you know really you know struggle with where we're going I I can't remember where I was even – I brought this up the other day in a group, and one of the pastors, he's actually from New Hampshire, and he was just kind of shocked, you know. And I said, you know, don't you realize in Massachusetts every every school has a gay straight alliance? Um, you know, they um, – last year it was um, – they had a movie night at my son's school, and um, so he decided to go. Well, he didn't realize it was being sponsored by the Gay Straight Alliance uh, the first movie was something about Matthew Shepard, the, the the gay guy out in Colorado. Second movie was uh, Brokeback Mountain, which is rated R, and I, you know, he's got a bunch of freshmen in there. I mean, you mm-hmm. know, that's 17 and over. 
And um, you know, but once you got there, they, they locked the doors. You know, you you know they you know you weren't allowed to to leave again. Um, you know they you know. Well, the the reason being though, they just oh. didn't want the kids running in and out. Yeah, I suppose. So if you if you came, you had to stay the whole night. You know that was that was part of it. You know, I mean, they didn't want you know kids coming, parents dropping the kids off there for the movie night, and then the kids just take off and. Okay. Yeah, if that makes you know, sense. Get drunk on the parking lot. I mean, that's you know that was. Don't most schools gross. have panic bars though? I mean, for fires. Yeah, but the, you know, but there's teachers there who are you know. Oh, okay. Get, All right, that way. You know that type of thing. So. Um, you know, so that you know, but so I, I mean, I, but that's just kind of part of the whole thing. So I just kind of feel kind of bad about, um, and I'm just not, sh- you know, I mean, this is, you know, this whole idea of a diversity day itself, you know, there's an agenda there that I have struggle that I struggle with. How about the fact uh, that they brought in a pastor as a speaker? <laughs> I'm just, you know, kind of wondering if, uh, you know, what if, uh, what if they wanted? Uh, what if the the uh, group's uh, Christian uh, alliance or something like that wanted to bring in a, a conservative Christian pastor? Would that be allowed? Yeah, I was gonna say. I was gonna say this is a white straight guy who who idea of diversity is. No, I don't think that would go too far. Diversity has its limits, you know. Uh, <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, although I mean the. the <sighs> I know. Not, I wish we knew more about it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but they, I mean, these people, I, I, I don't know. I, I just, I think they, they're overboard. They want to see, you know, all writings and all emails uh, to and from her. Um, you know, they just, they want everything. And I just, I just think it's an over, I, I think the, the school superintendent says uh, they've given some information, but overall the, the, the question is, uh, that the stuff they want is really too broad. They're making too broad a request. Uh, I really kind of agree with him. Um, yeah, it sounds like it's just being ridiculously blown out of proportion. You know, I, we've talked about this before. All right, if your school is doing something or you hear that your school is doing something and you've got a problem with it, go talk to the administration instead of, the, in, instead of suing the school. Because if you sue the school, all you're doing is hurting your own kids. By right. taking money away that could be used for school programs. Although there are stupid administrators. Yeah. And we've I talked mean, about that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you know that you know, uh, um, you know, there's a case in St. Louis and you know, the teacher told a kid he couldn't pray over his lunch and uh, um, you know, the principal backed the teacher and they worked through the administration, everybody backed the teacher, so they finally sued the school and you know the Courts, you know, swatted the teacher and the whole policy down. You know, and it's like you stupid people. Of course, you're going to lose that fight. Right, but then you don't but, sue for money. I mean, it doesn't really say that they're suing for money, but I'm not no, sure no. what they're suing for. Suing to uh, make sure they don't do it again or something. I don't know. They want information. You know, they want they want everything. They want all the information to be released. Um, you know, and pro- probably there is at least a thing in there for court costs, though, unless they're being, you know. Represented pro bono, mm-hmm. but uh, I don't know. That's California, the land of fruits and nuts. What can we tell you? <laughs> and, and, and Jim can, um, being from Massachusetts, knows all about. That. <laughs> all yeah. right. Well, that's our last story for tonight. We did get some feedback. Did you get this one, Jim? Yes, uh, from uh, our Mormon guy. Yeah, yeah, this is a comment on YouTube, I think. Yes, go ahead and you can share that. All right, he says, uh, Mormons, LDS, use the resurrected Jesus Christ. We were talking about how uh, uh, Mormon churches don't use crosses. Um, They use the resurrected Jesus Christ as a symbol of our faith, not the dying or tortured Christ. Now, we already talked about this in detail, why, you know, the difference. We even talked about it tonight. Um, He says, we still focus on the sacrifice of our Savior during communion. The water slash wine, it's water that they use, not wine, because they don't drink alcohol, um, to symbolize the blood that was spilled for us. The bread symbolize, symbolizing his body that was sacrificed for us and given for us, uh, which Jim and I as Lutherans would disagree with the word symbolize. Um, we believe in the real presence. Um, but 
He says, by the way, that article in the St. Louis Tribune, or I'm sorry, St. Louis, St. Louis on the brain, Salt Lake Tribune was not based on fact. Um, but he doesn't offer an alternative. And, you know, th- that's something that struck me. Uh, I've, this is in, in dealing with Mormons because I have a bunch of Mormon friends. Um, <clears throat> that that kind of struck me. As I hear this a lot. That's not based on fact. That's, they didn't get it right. That's a lie or whatever, but they never offer an alternative. Okay. So if that's not right, what is the truth? What is your side of the story? And that I can never get out of them. All right. I'm not saying that all Mormons are like that. I'm just saying that's my experience. And I don't understand what the deal is that, and, and to me, I'm, I'm sorry, but to me, that sounds like a cult that says, no, that's not right, but we're not going to actually give you the, the details. You just need to accept that that's not the way it is. And that's it. All right. This is, that article was about a book where a guy had done years and years of research. So I, you know, without an alternative with uh, an equal amount of scholarship, I've got to go with the guy that did all the research, not just a commenter on YouTube. So, uh, you know, sorry. Yeah. By the way, you know, he's got all these gay friends, all these Mormon friends. I think I'm his only Lutheran friend. <laughs> I've got lots of Lutheran friends. They're all members of my church, or else they're Missouri Synod pastors. <laughs> oh, nerds! All right. Hey, everybody. Have a good weekend. Um, today is the Festival of Ascension. We hope uh, you had a uh, joyous Ascension. We uh, held an Ascension service at our church. We just had a handful, but the people who were there said that, you know, they were very thankful that we had it. But uh, probably the hidden festival of the church, uh, Ascension, but it's a very powerful day for us to celebrate. No, it's not the hidden festival of the church. The hidden festival of the church is the Annunciation. A lot of churches have Ascension services, but the Annunciation, which is really the celebration of Jesus' conception, which is really, as far as I'm concerned, a bigger deal than his birth if we believe that life begins at conception. Um, and yet we celebrate Christmas, but not... But see, the problem is the Annunciation falls in the middle of Lent. And churches are already busy. They already have extra services and stuff like that. So the Annunciation kind of falls by the wayside. So um, it's in March. So if it ever falls out a Wednesday night in Lent when you have service, did you celebrate Annunciation? I think this year it did. I I always make a point of mentioning it somehow. We we put a, a Lutherans for Life had a, a bulletin insert that we used this um, this year um, for the the Sunday that was closest to it. And, uh, and I, I made a point of stopping to talk about it for a few minutes after the service. So I think it's okay. important to recognize that, you know, talking about the whole abortion debate. Okay. God bless you and watch over you, everybody. Yep. Good night, everybody. Oh, get a, get a hold of us. Uh, we're, we are thankful for that comment, even though we kind of disagree with some of the stuff he said. Um, but you know, we want to hear from you. And so before we leave, just a reminder uh, that you can uh, go to our website, crossfeednews.com, uh, post other stories, and uh, and get a hold of us there. And, or you can just send us an email to podcast at crossfeednews.com. So with that, good night, everybody, and God bless. Mm-hmm.